In the world of cameras, 2020 brought us a whole bunch of releases. We had the Canon R5, the Sony a7S III, the Lumix S5. We had a whole bunch of like kind of standout cameras that everybody was talking about, but there was one camera that kind of stuck through the cracks towards the end of the year, and that is the Lumix BGH1. You probably might not even have heard of this camera before until this video, but the Lumix BGH1 is a cube cinema camera that Panasonic came out with, and I had a chance to play with it for a couple weeks. So today in this video, we're gonna talk all about this weird, quirky, funky cinema cube. Those of you that have been watching this channel for a while know that I am a huge Micro Four Thirds shooter. I'm actually shooting this on a Blackmagic Pocket 4K, which of course is Micro Four Thirds, and the Lumix GH5 is my powerhouse camera for everything from client videos, pretty much everything under the sun I use the Panasonic GH5 for. It is a camera that I always try to replace with something, and I always keep coming, crawling back to that GH5. Now, I'm someone that also skipped the GH5S because it just didn't really seem like an upgrade for me. I like having internal image body stabilization, which the GH5S doesn't, and low light performance isn't usually something that concerns me because most of what I do is either controlled light or daylight. But when looking at cameras and looking at the camera market in general, there is one form factor that I think is really interesting and intriguing, and that is the cube. Before time began, there was the cube. If you've seen the Z cam or even a red Komodo or even red cameras or Alexa minis, all those cameras, they basically have a similar form factor and function, which is a rectangular cube. Now it seems like Panasonic saw this rising trend of cube style cameras and thought, what if we take a GH5S and squish it into a cube. And that is how you end up with the Lumix BGH-1. This is a GH5S for all intents and purposes in terms of its internals, squished into a cube form factor which makes it one of the best little pocket cinema cameras sorry, black magic, that you can probably buy right now for under $2,000. Now on the GH5, it kind of makes sense for that camera to be a photo body because it is also a photo camera. But on the Pocket 4K, it's never made sense to me why the form factor is mimicking a mirrorless DSLR when in fact it is just a pure video shooter. And it ends up being this really awkward middle child between a cinema camera and a mirrorless photo camera. And it's the worst of all worlds. It's one of the most unergonomic, inergonomic? unergonomic? It's one of the most non-ergonomic cameras that I have ever used. And so even though I love the image quality, I like how this looks right now, actually using the Pocket 4K, I can't stand it. And to be honest with you, this camera has been sitting on my shelf for like four months now through this pandemic, and it's just a camera I don't feel inspired to shoot on. Now, when I had the Cube though, I picked this thing up and I instantly fell in love with it. I do think that all of these cinema cameras, whether it's RED or Airy, all these cameras, they know that the cube makes sense. It's easy to rig, it's easy to hold, it's basically just a little box that you add all your bells and whistles to. And so when I knew I was getting this camera, I was thinking in my head like, I'm gonna rig the crap out of this thing. I'm gonna go nuts, I'm gonna Caleb Pike this thing. It's gonna be covered in all these different handles and rigs and all this kind of stuff that would just make it a beast. But when I finally had it in my hands, I realized all it needs is a monitor. So the thing is, this camera doesn't even have a display on it. This is a camera that is just a brain. It's just the meat and potatoes of a camera and then you add all the things that you need to it. So whether that's an external microphone, a handle, a monitor, whatever, you add that yourself. It's not a camera that you just pick up and you use right away. It does need some accessories. But then if you think of the Pocket 4K or the Pocket 6K, that needs a ton of accessories too. One of the main things being you need external power to run a lot of these cameras because the built-in batteries or the batteries that come with it are pretty much terrible. In the case of the BGH-1, one of my gripes with it is the fact that it uses a weird proprietary battery that is from the EVA-1, and it is quite difficult to source these batteries. I do know that Panasonic is probably working on making this a little bit easier for people to find them, so this could be, by the time you're watching this, a better situation. In my case, and while I had this camera, it was quite difficult to get the batteries. They did offer three batteries for me to play with, and to be honest with you, the battery life is so good that I only actually used one battery, but if you compare that to my Pocket 4K, I have to use V-mount batteries, just a whole fiasco to get a Pocket 4K or a 6K up and running. With this cube, it was as easy as throwing a Shinobi on it and powering it on and we are ready to go. If you're familiar with any other Panasonic cameras, it has a very similar button layout as well, except now it's on the top of the camera as opposed to the back of the camera. But all that means is once you have a monitor plugged in, you'll just be playing with those buttons 
as comfortable and as easy as it was to play with any other Panasonic camera, whether that's a GH5 or an S5 or a GH5S, whatever. The menu systems and the buttons are pretty much identical. You just kind of got to get used to using it with a monitor. Another area where this cube is an absolute monster is inputs and outputs. This thing has a mic jack, a headphone jack, a gen lock, an ethernet cable, a full size HDMI in a world where every camera manufacturer is now switching to micro HDMI and we all hate micro HDMI. Thank you Panasonic for keeping this full size HDMI. I have a feeling it has something to do with the internals and the fact that you guys have a little bit more space in these smaller Micro Four Thirds cameras to have a full size HDMI. But if any camera manufacturer is listening, please stop using micro HDMI. Full size is the way to go. It's safer, it's secure, it's just better in every single way. So yes, this cube does have a full size HDMI and it is wonderful. On top of the HDMI, there is also an ethernet port. And you're probably wondering why does this thing get the internet? Are you gonna go on Google with it? No, the ethernet port is so you can control it and also use it for streaming. So if you do broadcast, or even if you're just like a Twitch streamer, you do video games, whatever, even a Skype call, you can plug this thing over ethernet and control it entirely with your computer. And I think that's really interesting for people that work in broadcast or if you're in journalism, you need a nice compact camera solution that's very malleable and flexible, but also great for broadcast standards and streaming. Or even if you did like concert documentaries and stuff, you need to rig up like 20 of these cameras or VFX. This camera also supports AC power. So if it's something you're just keeping it on sticks, that's also always great for interviews when you're just sitting there for like four or five hours filming, you don't wanna deal with batteries. So you can just plug this thing into AC, let it run all day and you're absolutely fine. It's also great for streaming because you just don't have to worry about your battery dying. Lastly, there is a USB-C port and this can be used to transfer data. The way I used it though, is that I plugged it into my computer and I was able to control the camera entirely with a mouse and keyboard, which is awesome. And it's something you don't really realize is great until you actually try it out. If you do a lot of YouTube videos, having your laptop with you or having a computer with you, being able to monitor yourself and see what you're doing and be able to film yourself at the same time is amazing. And controlling everything is really, really simple and easy. It's it's just like using the camera itself, except now you're using it on your computer with full live preview. Internally with the sensor and also the processor, we're basically looking at the GH5S inside this camera, but there are some things and notable things that separate this camera from the GH5S. And I think that's what makes this a better buy than the GH5S or even the GH5 right now, if you are looking for a Micro Four Thirds cinema camera. On the dynamic range front, you are getting V-log out of this cube. And thus they are saying this now allows for an extra stop of dynamic range over the GH5S. Now, personally, I don't use the GH5S. I'm only used to V-log on the GH5, but I will say the files, even though they are similar in size and codec and bit rate, has a lot more flexibility than what I'm used to seeing on the GH5. The color science as well seems to be tweaked. It's matching a lot closer to what I saw when I used the Lumix S5. And it just feels a little bit closer to a cinema camera and less like a mirrorless camera, which I think the GH5 tends to lean towards if you're not careful with how you grade it. And here's something we're gonna talk about in every camera review this year, and we've been talking about it up to this point too. There is no bad sensor out right now. There is no camera that you can buy that looks Bad. So more than ever, and we've said this a thousand times, it's all about ergonomics, form factor, specific bit rates, resolutions, and frame rates that you need. It's not about the sensor, it's not about full frame, it's not about micro four thirds, it's not about any of that. It's about having a camera that inspires you and that you enjoy to use. So this cube is a niche camera, and I totally understand that it is not for everyone. This is a camera that's more of a chameleon. It's a camera that can adapt to various different situations, and more so in the broadcast world, I would imagine, as well as studio stuff. That being said, I'm someone that likes to hack things and use things for the ways that probably the manufacturer never really wanted them to be used. So what I would say is, this is a camera that is now Netflix certified, which is kind of insane because I believe it is now the cheapest Netflix certified camera. So for $2,000, you could get a little pocket size cinema camera and go make your Netflix documentary or go make your Netflix original, whatever is your movie, and know that there will never be a headache or a conversation with Netflix executives about what camera you used. And so in the democratization of creativity and then how we make movies and how we make TV shows now, what's more exciting than a cube camera is that the industry is now accepting these cameras more. So just for reference, an Arri Alexa Mini, which is kind of almost the same form factor as this little cube, but goes for $30,000, $40,000, if not more sometimes, is not Netflix certified. This camera does not shoot a true 4K signal, it's an upscaled image. Whereas with this cube, and even a GH5 or GH5S, or even this Pocket 4K, 
These are shooting a true 4K signal. So when Netflix puts a show up and customers are paying for their 4K signal, they wanna make sure the customer is actually getting a 4K image and not an upscaled one. So that's why a camera like the BGH1, which is only $2,000, is certified, but an Arri Alexa, which is $20,000 plus more, is not. Now, does it matter? No, you can make whatever you want with whatever you want, but it is just interesting for conversation's sake to think about how there's a $2,000 little cinema camera that the industry has accepted as a camera that we can use to make movies and TV shows. That to me is fascinating. And I think that exemplifies one of the most exciting things that's been happening in the camera industry lately, which is that everything's getting cheaper, the access is getting easier, and there's nothing holding us back anymore. Now there's really only two issues that I have with the BGH1, and one is the fact that it doesn't have a screen on it. Yes, it's totally easy to work around this just by adding a cheap monitor to your camera, but you know, sometimes you just wanna pick up your camera and start filming, or even just to go through the menu, you just want a little display, and I know the Komodo has this, and the Z cams have it, just to be able to like dance through menus, on the camera itself would be a welcome addition to this, and it's a bit of a pain to have to use an external monitor every single time you just wanna change settings. This thing is covered in function buttons, so you could set a whole bunch of custom things that you could probably rock it without a monitor. Why you would ever do that would be beyond me, but if you just need to throw it on a drone and you got your custom settings to get it ready to go, that's definitely possible, but just having a little screen on it would have been super clutch. The other issue I have with this camera is it doesn't shoot raw, and we are seeing more cinema cameras now, and even stuff from Panasonic, whether it's the S5 or the S1H, those cameras are shooting ProRes RAW, so it would be sweet to see a firmware update come to allow us to shoot ProRes RAW. I think this would put this camera directly in competition with the Pocket 4K, because right now, the only thing I would say that really has a leg up on this BGH1 with the Pocket 4K is the fact that it shoots B-RAW and it has a RAW codec. As a professional cinema camera now, even though I don't think it's the end all be all to have raw, it would just be really nice to have to future proof your system a little bit and have that latitude in post. So this is the BGH1, this little weird quirky cube camera. I hope that more manufacturers going forward make cube cameras because I do think they are one of the best form factors for a cinema camera. And I'm really glad Panasonic is experimenting and trying stuff like this and getting into this market because it means they care about video and you know, they still care about the Micro Four Thirds system too. And as someone who has been like cautious about the future of Micro Four Thirds, I can see how it makes sense still. Yes, full frame is great and all these other cameras are great. Super 35 is great, but there's something kind of special about Micro Four Thirds. The little tiny lenses, the fact that there's no heat issues, the fact that they can push bit rates and codecs a little bit more than their big brothers. I'm just, you know, Micro Four Thirds is still cool. And I like the fact that Panasonic and you know, even Blackmagic for that matter, care about this system. And I think we definitely see a few more years of life out of the Micro Four Thirds system. And this cube has restored my faith in it quite a bit. So now we're at my favorite part of the video, which is actually showing you what this camera is capable of. I've done another one of my weird HBO true crime reels with this thing. All I did was throw the Shinobi on top of the camera. And I just walked around 24 FPS handheld. I wanted to see how it felt. I wanted to see how, you know, it kind of rocked with my movement because this camera doesn't have internal image body stabilization. I did use an OIS lens though. So Panasonic also gave me the 12 to 60 F 2.8 Leica, which is a beautiful lens. In fact, it's probably a lens I'm probably gonna pick up soon for the GH5, just cause the OIS was so nice in it. But as a little handheld documentary style rig, I think the Cube with a nice little compact OIS lens, monitor, you're smooth sailing. I think this footage looks great. Without further ado, here's a reel with the Quirky Cube.
hope you like that reel. As you can see, it's an exciting time for cameras. It's gonna continue to be an exciting time for cameras. Thank you, Panasonic, for letting me play with this BGH-1. It's on my radar now of things that I potentially wanna buy, whether it's the S5 or the BGH-1. I'm still not entirely sure. I really should just buy nothing and stick to what I have right now because that would be the best course of action. But you know, the best course of action isn't always the action we take, is it? Because we all want new things because we are hacks that rely on cameras instead of our ability to make us feel like we know what we're doing. Maybe we should just focus on learning how to be better filmmakers and better creators instead. What a concept. Anyways, I'm Patrick Tomaso. Thank you so much for watching this video. If you have any questions about the BGH1, let me know in the comments and you will see me next time I feel like making a video. Peace. Oh.